Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 14 of the Crowns Win podcast. Today, I'm your host, host <laughs> Rory <laughs> Pamford, and I am filling in for Jared this week. Gowdy is back, our lovely co-host. Yes, Hello, I was Gowdy. out last week, Yes, and you were helping. Yeah. Now Jared's out. And I'm hoping yeah. I can do a better job as Jared than as Than you. as me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, well, let's. Let's start the show. Sounds good. And uh, yeah, who's our who's our guest coming in? Well, today, today we have, and I don't want to um, butcher this. So Greg Hallett. Hallett. Yes. There you go. Greg Hallett from Otter Co-op. Correct. Correct. Um, but I will let you introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm very morning. excited to be here and uh, share our co-op brand experience with you. Uh, my name is again Greg Hallett. I was uh, actually. Uh, asked to do this, uh, very excited to do this, uh, and uh, my history is kind of, I've, I'm working for Otter Co-op, I've been there for the last five years, I actually started out as their petroleum division manager, uh, and was able to open successfully one of our uh, largest uh, developments, which was in Chilliwack, BC. Okay. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was with uh, Federated Co-op, and uh, I actually worked in the region, Calgary region office, and my role there was to support uh, various retails. As, as a matter of fact, Otter Co-op was one of the retails that I supported. Okay. Uh, I did that for 13 years, and uh, prior to that, I was actually with another retail, uh, actually the largest retail uh, in our system, which is Calgary Co-op. Mm. Uh, last year, they exceeded sales of a billion dollars, so they are quite, quite large, very okay. diverse. And uh, yeah, uh, that's me, kind of my history in a nutshell. So. Okay, great. Yeah, so we'll yeah we'll be covering a lot in the petroleum division today. Okay. So I guess from the start, we'll kind of go uh, for for people that aren't as familiar with the co-ops, mm -hmm. we'll go into like the structure and kind of how those operate. Yeah, try not perfect. No, nope, that that's off. okay. Um, so like in a co-op, who are who, who are actually the owners? We're actually owned a hundred percent by our members. Okay. So in other words, if you have an active membership at Otter Co-op or any of the co-op retails across Western Canada, you are in fact an owner. Uh, that allows you a voice uh, in the direction of the co-op, yeah. and it also allows you to share in the profits at the end of the year by way of patronage refunds. Okay. So if the co-op has a profitable year, the money goes back to all of the member owners. Just quickly. Pa like yeah. a patronage, uh, patronage is that like a credit towards one of the retailers, the, or do they actually pay that you cash? That is cash. Oh, they actually that pay you cash. cash. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. nice. Actually, goes back in the way of cash. Now, nice. again, uh, each each member does build up equity based on the amount of their their purchases. Right. So once you get to a certain level, you will get a higher percentage back in cash. Right. Some of it is retained in equity, which yep. you you maintain ownership of. Yeah. Uh, again, if you ever leave the area, or a, in in the case of a business closing, you can certainly pull your equity out of the co-op. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like an investment. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. The, in the, it, so, so everybody's, a, all the members are owners. Correct. So in a sense, like a shareholder in, in a way. Yeah. How do operations, like how does it make sure, like, so how are operations run effectively and efficiently? Well, we, we have a leadership team. Okay. Uh, again, we also have some very terrific team members. Yeah. Uh, obviously, between leadership and the team members, uh, we try to run our businesses as efficiently as possible. Okay. And again, when it comes to the difference between what the board's responsibility is and what leadership responsibility is, we manage the day-to-day -day operations as a leadership team. Okay. The board, you're, you're within the leadership team? I'm within team. the leadership okay. team, yeah. And the board basically governs the direction that the co-op is going. So they spend a lot of time meeting with our CEO, planning. Uh, our five-year plan is updated regularly. Yeah. And basically, they kind of guide the direction based on membership feedback. Okay. What direction the co-op is going. And can that be anything from, like, future businesses that the yes. members want to see and everything? Yes. Okay. Exactly. That makes sense. Yeah. The, so, I, I read somewhere in, in doing some research that a lot of co-ops are, they say they're, they use the term zero profit. So, I think that goes back to what you're saying. All the profit goes back to Correct. the members. So, how, what facilitates being able to grow in, in a co-op, like for Otter Co-op as an example? Again, uh, investments, 
We okay. also get a tremendous amount of support by way of subsidies from our wholesaler. Again, this is part of the uh, wholesale group that yep. we are part owners of. Uh, by That's way of subsidies for Federated buildings. Co-op again? Federated Cooperatives Limited. Okay. And we basically have subsidy programs that actually allow the retail co-ops to go out and invest in their communities. New businesses, new properties, and new basically buildings, right? Okay. Yeah. So a lot of it, a lot of like the assets will come from like land development, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. The, again, going back to like how resilient, resilient these are, what, why do you think it is that like, so again, looking at the research, it says co-ops usually are successful past five years. And that's kind of like the magic number for a lot of businesses. So 80% of co-ops will get past five years. Yes. Whereas regular businesses under 50%. Yes. So can you kind of touch on that a bit more yeah. as well? I think a lot of it has to do with our ownership structure. Okay. Uh, and the way we do business. Again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have preferred shareholders mm -hmm. uh, that basically are looking to get you know a huge return on their capital investment. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have people jumping ship if things go bad or anything like that. Uh, the other thing is is you know we've got a very low risk of takeover or buyout because you know we have to get huge membership support to to sell off any of our assets and again it has to go through a board process approvals and everything else okay it just makes us stronger and it actually allows us to look at other opportunities okay and with retained earnings again with equity that we build up we invest that obviously in our community we also invested in new facilities and whatnot right. and that with what we get back from federated allows us to look at other opportunities right and again which these opportunities have to be sustainable Right. Yeah. And, and it has to be something that our membership will support. Yeah, I think we're yeah. going to get into it a sure. bit later. But oh, yeah. no, no, actually, it's, it is right yeah. here. OK, so like for uh, could, could you give us a bit of the history of Otter Co-op? So because yeah. it started back in 1922, correct? November 13th, 1922 is when uh, Otter Farmers Institute or okay. District Institute. Let me make sure I get the name right. Sorry. <laughs> Otter District Farmers Institute. Okay. Uh, they did open up as a cooperative, and this was basically 25 men and women that to start, you know, started the cooperative. And basically, the reason they did that is they wanted to, you know, provide agriculture awareness. Uh, obviously, back then there certainly wasn't a lot of population in the area. Right. Uh, they also wanted to make sure that, you know, they could have permanent, prosperous farms and businesses operating and that's why they started the whole cooperative way to get people to invest in the community and in the co-op and from there uh 1926 obviously uh we started out uh in 1922 doing stump powder what is now that? Stump, stump powder is more affectionately known today as dynamite okay okay um. and it was used for it was used for rock clearing right clearing. Yeah. Right. Uh, very popular back then. Yeah. But as more and more people joined the co-op, the, the need grew for more farming supplies. So 1926, okay. uh, we added hay, animal feed, uh, barbed wire and fertilizer. to Okay. The offering. So I see. I'm going to hit on kind of the chronological stuff yeah. and, and try to keep it as exciting as possible. You but can. Uh, <laughs> 1946, again, the need grew, uh, the membership grew and we opened a new food store, which offered grocery and hardware. I see. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 1950, bulk petroleum started. And we'll talk a little bit more. Yeah, about we'll, that get into we'll get into that. We'll get into that a lot. Yeah. yeah. 1972 was the first gas bar. Okay. So that you could buy uh, like pump public gas fuel. Okay. Public fuel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then 1980 was when we opened up a new shopping center, uh, a larger one that offered uh, family fashions. Uh, okay. food and hardware. Now, uh, quickly on that. So mm -hmm. you guys have like the gas bars and uh, we'll get into like the that like the wholesale side of the business cuz yeah. you were involved with that. Mm -hmm. Where does where does Otter Co-op extend to generally for membership? You know, it today we're pretty much Fraser Valley, mm -hmm. Lower Mainland. We do have two uh, new locations that we opened up, Gaspar Convenience Stores. One is in Penticton. Okay. So we're growing in that market as well. And the other one uh, just opened last year in West Kelowna. I see. So again, uh, there's not really, I guess, a territory or boundary to say. 
uh, we basically go where the opportunities are. Oh, okay. Okay. And, uh, you know, again, it's our strengths have been in the lower mainland. We've had a little bit of challenge cracking the, across the river kind of stuff. And I think a lot of that mostly has to do with property values. Right. Uh, you know, getting properties rezoned for the right, re, you know, right. Yeah. locations. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's, uh, you know, we, we basically go where the opportunities are and where there aren't other co-op retails that are already in that business, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I actually had a question. We, when you talk about membership, is um, the co-op a member only type of? No. So no. it's open to? It's open to everybody. But oh, again, okay. when, you, when you look at it, it's a $10 one-time lifetime fee to become a member. And then you can start sharing in the profits and actually start right. voicing your opinion on the direction of the co-op. Okay. So, okay. But again, anybody can shop there, but why not be a member and get something out of it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then, okay, I think we've gotten to 1972. So then mm. from there, it expanded a, a, a bit further. Yes. Uh, again, you know, we, we have basically in the last probably 10 years really seen a lot of growth and development uh, in basically the petroleum area, Gaspar convenience stores. Uh, one of the things we can talk about, I guess, and I don't know if it's later on, but I can bring it up now because I love to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we basically just opened our latest venture uh, on our existing property at 248th Street and uh, Fraser Highway, our brand new liquor store. Oh, okay. So again, wow. we talk about diversification and getting into all lines of business that are sustainable and profitable. And right. Again, uh, we had our grand opening yesterday. Okay. If you get an opportunity to come out and see it, it is a, I call it more a liquor experience yeah. than a liquor store because it's, it's just beautiful the way it's laid out. Everything is, you know, easy to find. Uh, there's such a great selection and we've got great people working there, so. Okay, Perfect super. Stop. Yeah. So that was like the latest venture. I guess yep. I guess now we'll we'll kind of get into like a lot of our listeners are interested in like the industrial sector. So whether it's like mining, energy, yeah. uh, forestry, agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I, with Otter Co-op it's a lot in the agriculture, but we'll kind of we'll kind of go into like the petroleum business. Mm -hmm. So you worked I guess it kind of goes a little bit before when you were with the the wholesale unit. Yep. So for the petroleum sector in itself with Otter Co-op, I guess if you can give a bit, like how did that build up over time? And like, we'll get into details on that yeah. side of the business. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that we are going to talk about today too, I think is uh, our co-op refinery complex. Yes. And again, this is part of our wholesale business that was, again, started just like most traditional co-ops with, with eight farmers that okay. basically wanted a, a better deal and wanted to provide something to membership uh, that they could actually sustain. And okay. again, that started, I believe, in 1935 is when the original refinery was built. Oh, uh, back, okay. Yeah, this was in uh, Regina, Saskatchewan. And again, it's part of our whole co-op network. Mm -hmm. uh, they started out producing 500 barrels a day, <laughs> right? Uh, our latest tally... Uh, with some of the upgrades that they've done to this facility is 130,000 barrels a day. Wow. Yeah. So that's it's come a, a long way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's so that's been built and obviously upgraded yeah. over the years. So when when you were with that side of it, so that's in a way because I know in our call before I was asking you about like hedging strategies and you said, mm -hmm. well, we actually own the refinery. Yes. So you're, you're in a sense that that co-op is buying raw product and just bringing it into. Absolutely. Okay. And, and you know, the nice thing about it too, and again, we, we talk about different ways to, to be profitable in the refining business. And yeah. one is, you know, obviously you can buy like crude. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to produce the finished product. From, okay. from that. Yeah. Uh, the other option is to go into heavy crude, which is a little more money. And unless you actually have an upgrader on your refinery, you really can't deal in that kind of product. So there is usually what we call a crack spread between uh, heavy product and light product. Right. It's fairly significant. Right. So there's definitely some profit margins that are realized there. Mm -hmm. And again, with the refinery. Do refinery's you have the upgrader at your refinery as well? You have the upgrader at you our do? Okay. refinery. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. Got yeah. it. Again, I, I can't speak, I guess, with 100% confidence about everything to do with the refinery. Uh, yeah. But again, I can, you know, share what knowledge I do have and Absolutely. what's been shared. But uh, again, it's, it's a great 
uh, you know, opportunity for retails, uh, you know, to basically have that investment structure so that, you know, when they do share in the profits of Federated each year, they can reinvest some of that money in their community, more services, more businesses, lines, whatever, uh, and then share profits as well with customers. So the money all goes back. You mentioned earlier about zero profit. Uh, again, at the end of the year, there aren't one individual or two individuals or, you know, 10 individuals for that matter that yeah. are getting, you know, pockets lined. Let's put it that way. Right. Uh, the money all goes back to the local community, anybody that's invested in the cooperative. So okay, tremendous opportunity. Yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. That, yeah, it's a, definitely a different structure, but you mentioned about like credit unions, and that's getting into the financial sector, which yeah. we don't we yeah. don't really cover on the podcast, but mm -hmm. it is interesting that that has been that this format has been so successful. And it doesn't seem to get a lot of it doesn't actually seem to get a lot of focus from like even when I was growing up, you don't hear a lot about it, but there's definitely opportunities for membership. Absolutely. The so I had this one question about the uh -huh. uh, in the energy sector and agriculture, there's always downturns and sometimes they can be brutal. Does that like having the refinery and even in the agriculture business, when you were with the federated co-op, how do you how do you kind of plan for those inevitable downturns? You know, it we talked a little bit about diversity. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going to kind of start out with a little bit of an analogy that uh, you probably have heard this saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the one thing I think that's really helped the cooperative movement is that we haven't got everything heavily invested in one particular commodity. Okay. We're always looking to diversify and bring other profit centers into our business. Uh, again, food has been a big uh, you know, big strength for us. Yeah. Uh, again, I mentioned Calgary Co-op. You know, sales of a billion dollars. Yeah, I that's mean, a, unreal. A lot of that is is food store and oh, you okay. know, gas bar convenience stores. So yeah. you know, there's definitely a lot of opportunity out there. Uh, you know, basically from a wholesale perspective, we always have peak and valley seasons. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, even with Otter Co-op, we go through our winter period, which is where we have to rely a lot on our other than farmer business because obviously they're yeah. they're going and having their vacations and stuff yeah. and, you know, getting getting some downtime. And then, like I said, we get hit usually end of March. Things start to, to perk up. Uh, but again, we have various customers. We, we deliver to forestry. We deliver to uh, aggregates. Yeah, that's one thing yeah. I was going to touch on. That's mm -hmm. a part of the, in the fuel business, That's you're actually directly delivering to customers Absolutely. with that as well. Absolutely, yeah. Right. Yep. We are we are a full, full functional retail. Uh, yeah. And again, we do deliver uh, as far as hope. Uh, and then we go all the way to the ocean. So okay. it's a very big territory. Right. Uh, again, how we got our start, uh, we started with one bulk plant. Okay. Uh, and one truck. And a very small truck. Yeah. I, don't even, <laughs> I don't even think you'd classify it as a single axle anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but basically, primarily, we delivered heating fuel and farm fuel, which oh, was part okay. of fuel, right? Yeah. Uh, now we have seven trucks, and we're going to be delivering about 38.1 million liters by the end of this year. So. Okay, yeah, so it's the a end huge of our increase. operating year, which is February twenty eighth. So. I see. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, the I don't I don't know if this actually applies with Otter Co op, but the one thing was going into you, you source products, so you obviously have to source the the crude. Um, yeah. And is there exchange agreements that you have to use for doing that and for like for the agriculture side as well? I guess that's all kind of built in with the co-op structure, right? It is. is. And again, when it comes to raw, uh, unrefined product, yeah. uh, obviously that is all done through our wholesale, yeah. uh, through CRC, the, the co-op refinery complex. Uh, where the exchange agreements come in is where it's almost impossibly logistically to get product out to at a reasonable cost, okay. i.e. from Regina to Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, what we've done in the past is we've actually set up exchange agreements, and you'd almost call it like trading product. Okay. Uh, you know, obviously there's a demand and need for them to get product locally from our refinery, uh, which would probably cover Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's a need for our co-ops to basically source product you know, closer to where we actually oh, live. Oh, so you're almost doing like a like a trade yeah. scenario. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's a pretty big, that must be a big driver is, in the strength. It is a big thing. It is a big thing. And again, you know, the unfortunate thing is that uh, we have had tremendous growth 
over the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, we're starting to see some of that product availability become less and less. Uh, we've actually what do you mean by product uh, less and less? What it is less. is they're not trading as much product with us from our refinery okay. as we require from their terminals, right? Oh, so okay. once that gets out of balance, and mm -hmm. again, I, I always say that I, I have the most admiration for the folks that work on these agreements because it's all over <laughs> the place and it changes, yeah. right? It yeah. changes. You try to budget for it every year, but it's a tough number to, to get exact. So it's tough for them. I have a whole lot of respect <laughs> for them and what they do. I don't know how long I'd do it with, you know, I've already lost a lot of my hair. I'd probably lose the rest. <laughs> of uh, it, it's tough. Uh, for us, again, we actually started something new because when you get to the point where you don't have the product to trade, you then have to buy product. Right. right. For us to be competitive and offer competitiveness to our members, we actually last year started railing product out from our refinery. Oh, uh, to okay. Port Coquitlam. And what we do is the rail cars are unloaded by a transloading facility yeah. onto delivery trucks, B trains, which haul about 48 to 50,000 liters of fuel, and then they're delivered to our locations. Okay. Okay. What that does is it now allows us to capitalize on the netbacks, whereas if we trade product, there's, there's no netbacks when we get it from them. So. I yeah. see. Yeah. With with that refinery going back into that a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, just because there's a lot of talk nowadays, especially in the oil business, because they can't get the product out, we're yeah. getting just the prices are getting beaten down. Yeah. Was that refinery like as it built up that that was all done through the co-op, so that would have all been privately done. Well, essentially? again, again, reaching back to what was shared. Yeah. Uh, Originally, that when they started the expansions and started getting bigger and started, you know, needing more capital, the Saskatchewan government was actually one of the partners with them. Oh, okay. On the upgrader. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, some years back, and I, I, I don't want to give the date because I'll probably get it wrong. That's okay. <laughs> but the, the Saskatchewan government uh, basically wanted to sell their portion of the upgrader back to the co-op system. Oh, okay. And uh, it, it was a pretty quick payback for the co-op retailing system. So uh, great deal for them, great deal for us. They got much needed capital, and we basically got 100% control of our upgraders. So, so it was like a public-private partnership yes. in a sense, and yes. then it was sold back. Yeah. Okay. But that was, again, just the upgrader. It, it had nothing to do with the refining process right. of it. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost, sometimes you think they could uh, maybe add in another one at some point. You know, <laughs> and, and again, I'm, I'm saying this, uh, you know, biting my tongue, but uh, there certainly have been uh, other opportunities in the refining business that we have looked at. Yeah. Uh, again, it's just long term, when you take a look is, you know, where is fuel going to be, yeah. in, you know, 50 years from now? Yeah, and that's... That's the thing. When you look at what it cost us, I mean, our upgrade, I believe it was done back in 2000, I'm guessing here, but 2012 was $3 billion. Wow. That was for an upgrade. Okay. Yeah. A brand new refining facility would probably cost you $15 billion. So yeah, and that's a lot of money. Yeah. And then, yeah. yeah, like you said, in 50 years, where is it actually yeah. going? Yeah. It's, I mean, we, yeah. we're seeing a lot. I mean, I guess, and you're looking at the same thing when you see all this development in the like the green sector, like yeah. we've got electric vehicles happening or plug-in hybrids, that's lowering that demand. And I think, I think people, I think fuel is one of the biggest drivers. Yeah. Like yeah. gasoline and diesel are yeah. the biggest drivers. Absolutely. And again, I mean the incorporation and you know legislation for us to use ethanol and biodiesel. Yeah. Uh, again, slows down demand for the finished product. Right. Right. Yeah. So, again, it's we're always looking for alternative alternative power, uh, you know, whether that's electricity yeah. uh, yep. to handle the hybrids and whatnot. Uh, we certainly, you know, are looking at those with open eyes to mm -hmm. make sure that, you know, we're getting in there and investing at the right time. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like computers. You get into it and then it changes 30, 40 times before it, you know, and you never really get the finished product. So no. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's uh, th that's a good uh the one I'm just trying to see if we've covered all these topics. The it, with efficiencies in that, we, people like the like the technology side of all these different yes. businesses. 
How has that been used throughout your business, whether it's in the petroleum division or the agriculture sector? Has it has technology, like you said about getting into computers, are always changing? Have you seen a big change in efficiencies with the technology side of it? We have, and I mean, there's there's a tremendous amount of focus every year putting on trying to reduce costs. Okay. Uh, the other big push is obviously from an environmental perspective. Uh, again. Uh, you know, Measurement Canada, Environment, I guess, Environment of BC. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of push from their expectation to say, you know, if you have a spill, there's certain policies, procedures you need to have in place to make sure that it's not going to have long-term consequences or damage. Uh, we've seen a big shift. Uh, one of the things now, when you go and look in each of the municipalities, there is actually a requirement now that if you have on-site storage, yeah. uh, you have to submit an environmental plan, mm. you have to have a uh, dike and liner, and you basically have to have a double-walled tank, which, okay. b- which basically is trying to reduce the amount of risk that's involved if you do have a spill on your property. Oh, okay. Right? With our trucks, again, uh, they're checked annually. Uh, for meter calibration. Uh, our folks, uh, we also have to go in and have the tanks visually checked it, all the vet tanks, piping, and hoses checked right. annually to right. make sure that there's no leaks. Uh, the other thing we've gone is from, you know, way back in the, the good old days, <laughs> handwritten invoices. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. And, you know, meters that were not temperature compensated or, or calibrated on a frequent basis. Uh, basically, to we now have you know technology on the trucks that one it records every single milliliter of fuel that's delivered. Right. Uh, it also we can set it up so that we know whose cust- which customers we're delivering to. It prints them off an invoice. Everything is temperature corrected. So right from loading to delivering, everything is recorded down to the last milliliter. Right. So it makes us a lot safer. The other thing that we've incorporated now too, which is also helpful, I mean, when we look at farmers and even commercial companies, I mean, input costs, you have to monitor them. Otherwise, they could get out of control. Mm -hmm. Not so much even from an environmental standpoint, which is important, but loss of profit margin, uh, theft, that kind of thing. We actually started a cellular-based tank monitoring program that we've rolled oh, okay. out to a number of our customers. Uh, it's helped us become more efficient because now, you know, we get the call, they order fuel, they have no idea how much they're going to take, so it's a blind dispatch, right? Maybe mm. they'll take a thousand, maybe they'll take five thousand. With the monitoring now, we can actually load a truck and be able to get rid of every single liter of fuel. Oh, because you know exactly how much each customer needs. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess that, in a way. Even that reduces environmental risk. It does. Because it does. it's it's less, you're not just taking a tank out, emptying half of it, exactly. having to go back. Yeah, exactly. So all that thing, which is good. I mean, you just, you hear all this flack that happens, whereas the industry has come a long way in certain measures to yes. to avoid potential disasters. So that's, that's good. No, absolutely. In, in terms of technology, just because we're moving in, to mm-hmm. the new technology. Yes. Have you found anything that's not th- or hasn't worked the way you thought or should have? You know, I, I guess there's a ton of dispatch programs out there, electronic dispatch programs. And again, we've had a challenge trying to find one that meets the needs of everybody. Mm. Uh, our dispatcher may love this program because some of the features that it's got, the drivers on the other hand, uh, I mean, when I look at it, I we want our drivers to be delivering fuel. We yeah. don't want them to be bookkeepers and, and you know, have to do accounting and, and basically have to spend half their time on a computer screen, you know, updating files and stuff. Uh, it would be nice if we could find something that, you know, was basically already set in place mm. that we could use and it would fulfill both the dispatcher's purpose, which is obviously to, you know, to route and dispatch the fuel, and yeah. the drivers, which we want to spend less time punching stuff into a keypad or a computer and doing deliveries. So that's, right. that's one of the things. That's one of the, yeah. yeah. Has it been hard to kind of move into the new? You know, we've, we've tried uh, a couple of different ones on a, on a trial basis, just couldn't seem to get it to work. Okay. Uh, the other thing we ran into is that when you have a new driver, like we're trying to get a program that's going to incorporate dispatch, uh, routing, yeah. and also navigation. 
Oh, so okay. When you hire a new driver, and and I mean, I'll say this honestly, it takes six months to a year for a new driver just to get used to the territory. Really, I mean, it would be different if they did the same deliveries every day, but in the fuel business. That's, that's not always yeah. possible, right? They have to be diverse enough to go different territories, different directions. So mm. it, it would certainly help, uh, yeah. you know, us identify where the efficiencies are. Yeah. I mean, right now we're using a program basically that just has territories and all the dispatches lined up to be in that particular territory. So mm. it's, it's worked so far. Yeah. Uh, but again, the other thing is too is, is we have maps that we use of the customer's properties. Uh, they're not always quick to update them when they move stuff around, but again, it gives our drivers an idea of what to expect when they hit the property. Mm -hmm. uh, not only, you know, getting into the yard and whatnot, but we have several customers that you, you are right off the Fraser Highway and there's traffic on the Fraser Highway. Yeah. yeah. Backing a 50 foot truck out onto the highway is not always an easy thing. So yeah, yeah that's actually a good point. Yeah. You've got some interesting setups yeah. for these, yeah. yeah, for yeah. heavy hauls. No, exactly. Um, I'll actually, for, for the next set, uh, Gowdy's going to go into some of the, the, the background of you. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'll let you take it away from there, Gowdy. Yeah, <laughs> no, um, yeah, I actually, I was actually, uh, kind of interested to know a little bit more about you and your role, um, with the company. You also mentioned that you just recently had an anniversary, correct? I did, yes. Uh, November the 12th. 2018 was my 40th year wow. with uh, the co-op retailing system and my fifth year with Otter Co-op. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm also a little bit excited too is uh, I've been in my new role, which is projects and facilities manager, which again is designed because of our growth strategy. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, we're looking for sustainable uh, long-term good investments for our members to make sure that, you know, we're not spending their money fruitlessly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, the big thing is, is I've, I've been in this job for two weeks. Uh, I was doing a little bit of it before that, but it was primarily just for petroleum opportunities. But now, you know, it's, it's carte blanche. I'm whatever opportunities are out there. Those are the ones we're seeking. And, uh, I can probably, I know there's, uh, there's other things I can go into, but, uh, you know, we talked about the liquor store. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm also proud to announce that we are under construction for a new food store in Abbotsford as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Kay. So uh, we've got lots of lots of uh, wood in the fires, but uh, again, we have to make sure before the the system invests the money in these locations that they have to be sustainable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, well, can you tell us more how you started y your kind of background with the company? Yeah. You know, I. Uh, I, I tell people that I started when I was 10 years old at the co-op. <laughs> uh, and to be quite honest with you, I did. But it was more of a, uh, I guess, a uh, on the side. I didn't have to pay tax on the, the $5 I got to fill oh, the nice. holes in the... Uh, <laughs> you know, and again, it was because our next door neighbor was actually a store manager for Calgary Co-op. And, you know, he would take his kids and us, and we would go spend a Sunday, right, uh, filling cracks in the pavement with tar and basically our reward was you know we got five bucks and mm. and uh, I mean that was that that's my unofficial start <laughs> right <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I actually uh, uh, got a job uh, in a gas bar service station uh, with Calgary co-op uh, in my last year of high school so okay. I was 17 years old and uh, there was so much opportunity within the organization uh, and not only within Calgary Co-op, but, you know, there, there's over 200 plus more retails in the system that, you know, if, if you've got the drive and the initiative and when want to learn, uh, it's open. Open sea, you can go anywhere. You can do anything. And that's kind of how my career went. I started off with Calgary Co-op, uh, moved up through the ranks where I was managing gas bar facilities for them. I went into the office after, you know, uh, getting my business certificate, business management certificate, went into the office and worked in marketing mm. for two years, and then basically went back out and I uh, worked in a store, at, or actually I worked in Strathmore, which is just outside of Calgary, right. as a business manager. So I looked after all the employee relations, uh, 
it was fun dealing with WCB and <laughs> and the union. So fun. <laughs> that was that was a fun part of my yeah. life. But uh, yeah. <laughs> great learning experience for I me. I bet. Right. That's I bet. Yeah. And uh, from there, I had an opportunity to move into a wholesaler role. So I actually started off as a coordinator uh, in the petroleum department at Federated in Calgary. And I actually, my primary uh, responsibility was Calgary Co-op. And at that time, they were growing at an immense proportion, right? Uh, after that, I got promoted uh, and I actually started to manage uh, the marketing department in Calgary region. Uh, did that for probably about 11 years. Okay. And, uh, you know, then I, my kids are grown. They've, uh, you know, they're on their own. They do their own thing. Uh, I hear from them when they need money, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, uh, my wife and I, my wife actually worked for the uh, Energy Utilities Board. They've changed names about three times. That's the only one I really Was that in Alberta? In Alberta. Okay. And she worked out of their Calgary office downtown. Uh, f- she was there for 37 years. Wow. wow. So she retired. Because we had an opportunity to come out here and, and work with the folks at Otter Co-op, become part of the senior leadership team, and uh, mm. try and get that facility in Chilliwack up and running. Uh, I mean, it's a great investment, but you talk about, you know, the ability to manage your debt. Uh, we actually paid off our portion of that facility in three years. What and facility is that in Chilliwack? Is it's, that the f- it's actually a bulk petroleum plant. It's a 24-hour card lock, and it's uh, oh, a gas okay. convenience store. Oh, okay. okay. I see. Lickman Road and Progress Way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's it's kind of built in the industrial area. And, you know, I think originally the Gaspar Sea Store was kind of an afterthought is that, you know, this, this is primarily industry or industrial use. And mm-hmm. we want to make sure that we capitalize on that. But then we saw what a couple of the Gaspars in that area were doing for volume. And we thought, wow, yeah. let's, let's do that <laughs> let's too. Do we that. got room on the property. Let's do that yeah. too. So, yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So, so that we've w- had a lot of. A lot of different titles, a, a lot, lot of different, of different jobs. titles, yeah. yeah. And again, in, in my current role, uh, you know, basically is to identify and, you know, I guess provide uh, the board and our senior leadership team uh, with reasons why or why not we should, you know, look at certain ventures. Uh, the other is to manage our existing tenant portfolio, mm-hmm. right, and to get other tenants uh, in some of the properties that we own. So it's it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, and what are important elements of leadership for you? You know, it, I think everybody has to look at themselves is you're a team member first, team leader second. Uh, my team is going to kill me because I use this analogy <laughs> everywhere I go. Uh, you know, I, I look at it as that we're, we're in a canoe. We're all paddling to get to the other side of the shore, right? Uh, if you're not paddling the right direction, then it's our job as a leader to get you in sync with everybody else and make sure that you're, you know, doing your goal. Uh, there's also an, another one I kid is that because if you're drilling holes in the boat, the team is going to throw you out. <laughs> <laughs> so, True. you know, again, uh, you know, my whole thing is, is if you can keep your people engaged, keep them feeling challenged, and make sure you're recognizing their achievements, uh, they'll do anything for you. Uh, you've probably heard this before. People quit leaders. They don't quit businesses, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's the way that, that, you know, we're using a performance management system so that everybody has clearly defined goals. We know what we're all responsible for, right? And, I mean, that comes right down from our five-year plan through our board and our CEO, and then it just kind of topples down. They all interconnect. Mm-hmm. So it makes it so much easier to keep track of what you have to do. And again, that goes right down to probably the toughest job in our organization is our frontline staff, right? Yeah. Our frontline team members, they, they take the brunt. So they're, they're our champions. They're our heroes. Yeah. 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 Um, and to just to further that, um, your personal values, not just, but I want to expand your personal yeah. values and then the companies. You know what is really terrific about, you know, developing a mission statement, a vision statement, and then talking about values. We had an opportunity as a senior leadership team with our board to actually sit down and kind of voice our own, you know, values and visions and see how it fit with the co-op. I always tell people when they come in for a job interview is it's not so much all about how you fit, but for you, it's how we fit. Here's who we are, 
right? Mm -hmm. Is this something that you're passionate about, right? So I believe in integrity. I believe in community and I believe in excellence. In other words, my day-to-day -day life is always done in honesty. Sometimes in a family situation, you, you may not be 100% honest, but <laughs> do these pants make me look fat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but again, I mean, I think in business and even in real life, it's you strive to be honest in every situation. Uh, I don't blow smoke up people's skirts. I, you know, I, you get what you get. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's how we do business. And that's how we build our businesses. I'm not high pressure. I'm not high, you know, high sales. I'm, I want to build relationships and, and even friendships. Like you may not buy from me today, but hey, two years down the road, hey, I know a guy. Right. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things that, that make me who I am. Uh, the other is, is when you talk about community, to me, it's all, it's people, right? My involvement with different charities. Uh, I'm involved, you know, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I, I spend time at the Legion. And again, it's, it's things that we do in our own communities that are going to get us recognized and our co-op brand also gets recognized, right? Yeah, it's like a joint, yep. it's like a yeah. joint, yep. joint win. Yep. Oh, that's, that's yep. great. And again, in excellence, uh, you know, we all from, you know, day one have to be innovative. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there are some people that, you know, have a hard time changing, but when you accept the change is inevitable and, you know, you deal with it. So, yeah. Yeah. No, especially because you, you mentioned how the company is always looking to evolve and to change into different Absolutely. areas and expand. Right. Yeah. There's no so sacred that's cows. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> sacred cows. Yeah. No. Yep. No, that's yep. that's good. It's good yep. to hear. Yep. Um, well, I, I, I got all my questions answered, so thank you. So <laughs> I don't know, you have more questions? Ju <laughs> yeah, a few more. How are we doing? We're doing pretty good We're for doing time. Good. Yeah, we've got lots we can of time. Really all unpack. right, right on. <laughs> <laughs> we can, can really unpack the last oh, yeah. section. Yeah. No, it's really, it, it, just following up on that point, it is really, like you said, no sacred cows, because you definitely have seen it in the last however long, and you can take a number of examples, but people that get companies and people and the company is a people, so they get stuck in that same same ideology, yes. and they just will not, they just can't get out of that yeah. that muck, in yeah. a sense. And mm -hmm. it's it's good to see, like, where you're saying you're expanding into different ventures, because, yeah. like you're saying, if you want to go put in 10 or 20 billion into a new refining facility, when yeah. what's, maybe it's better to look in 10 years at something to do on the electric side, because mm -hmm. that could be a huge opportunity. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. And taking that in for for the future of Otter Co-op, you you've talked a lot about your current offerings. So yep. from the food, yep. the new liquor store, yep. uh, the gas bars, the, the delivery. Um, it I think you even like mentioned like uh, like retail stores, like grocery outlets, and that. Have yep. we missed any for for you some know, of the offerings? It, it, we're always on on the look for new opportunities. Okay. Uh, one thing that I think we would like to really push in the future is, uh, you know, obviously from a petroleum's perspective, uh, we do have a full offering of oils and lubricants. Oh, okay, you do. Uh, we certainly have not, I guess, I wouldn't say scratch the surface because we are, we are, do have a lot of loyal customers that, that believe in our, our brand when it comes to, you know, our products. Yeah. Uh, but it would be nice if we could offer it uh, at a different, on a different scale. In other I words, see. A, a bulk truck that could yeah. actually, you know, deliver lubricants to a lot of different businesses that have their own storage and aren't really looking to, you know, t to have drums and totes delivered to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other thing is uh, diesel exhaust fluid. Even though there's now talk that that might be past technology and they won't be using it a lot more in the future, uh, there's still a lot of trucks out there that have those systems on them, mm -hmm. and uh, you need diesel exhaust fluid for them to operate. So, yep. okay, uh, you know, we do have them uh, a bulk offering at our card lock, but it would be nice to be able to get that out to customers' locations as well. With with your products and that, is it all within the network, or do you even do you have it sometimes where you're offering it out at different retail locations? You know, it each retail ha each location kind of has their own strength. Okay, uh, they also have their own markets. Is mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, if you look at what the offering is at you know our two forty eight Street location, it's different than what we have at Penticton. 
You know, mm-hmm. it has to do with age groups and who your customers are. Uh, you know, and that's the type of thing that co-ops really try to keep in touch with is, you know, is this the right stuff for us to sell? I mean, yeah. why bring it in if it's just going <laughs> to sit there on the shelf and get yeah. anniversary after anniversary? So, yeah. you know, a lot of businesses run that way. They, you know, again, it has to be something that is, is going to sell or, you know, you might as well not even bring it in. Yeah. Right. That's do a lot of research, do a lot of history. Like when you're looking at where you want to build, what mm-hmm. you want to offer. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is a lot of times when I look at a, at a competitive property, I look to see what other businesses are in the, in the neighborhood yeah. and you know, how much are they b- investing in their facilities? It usually tells me how well they're doing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is there been growth? Uh, what is the uh, OCP plan or the community plan, overall community plan for that particular area? Or is there going to be more residential? Is there going to be more commercial? Right. Those are all the different things that you have to look at when you're before you even plan on building, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's actually really, yeah, that's a great point. Because you can, I mean, you can go, you can take too long and not pull the trigger on something. But absolutely. that research is so vital with absolutely. something like this. Yeah. No, absolutely. The... I, we, we, you mentioned a little bit when we talked uh, on the phone for future businesses as well. And I don't know if some of this stuff is like proprietary, so you can't even get into it. But like, is there other businesses and commodities that you're currently can talk about that you're kind of looking that you're interested in? You mentioned already the lubricants. Yeah. Is there any other ones that you're thinking might be might have a good future well, with Otter Co-op? The one great thing, and I mean, we've got a pretty strong network uh, when it comes to our bagged feed. Okay. Uh, you know, we have customers all over British Columbia, Vancouver Island. Uh, I oh, think you're we're Vancouver actually Island as well. Vancouver Island for, okay. for feed. And again, yeah. we, we actually sell that through a network of what we call dealers or resellers. Oh, you do? So they have a contract stating that, you know, they can sell a particular product that we make. I see. Uh, and, you know, the nice thing about it is that we manufacture our own feed. Uh, so it's, it's done to whatever customer specifications you want. Uh, you know, and again, it's, it's, we went through, you know, obviously the bird flu, uh, oh, yeah. you know, we went through the mad cow disease and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of different regulations and restrictions put on, you know, feed operators and feed manufacturers. And, uh, you know, we got through that unscathed, uh, you know, our business continues to grow and, you know, we see that being something we can expand on in the future. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Great. But again, food stores. Yeah. Uh, you know, pharmacies. Yeah, you mentioned, you did touch on that. I mean, we do talk a lot of the industrial, but you did touch on like yeah. pharmaceuticals. You're yeah. starting to do that as absolutely. on a wholesale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And again, you know, you're talking about a business that's regulated. So if you yeah. got to make sure you got all your I's and dotted and T's crossed. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of challenges sometimes. But uh, mm-hmm. again, it's, it's, it's what our members want. Yeah. And if they'll support it, then we will basically venture into that business. Right. Uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier, we, we actually have uh, a co-op retail in Manitoba that runs a funeral business. Right. Right. Oh, wow. So you can get patronage on your funeral <laughs> costs. Right. And again, it's, you know, whatever is going to fit in that particular community is, is what you basically are going to focus on. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah, quite yeah. interesting how, how things get laid out for like what, what you're investing yes. in. And it changes by region, of yeah. course, as yeah. well. And we're... Always on the look for another opportunity in the liquor business. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's always yeah. a good yeah. good business. No, absolutely. So for I guess in closing, the for the future of Otter Co-op and other co-ops in Canada in general, where do you see where do you see it going? Like, do you see a lot of potential for for growth? Like, is it still is there still a lot of people that could like that may not realize the benefits? Like you say, you mentioned like how. Uh, just not they're not banks, but they are the the credit union. The credit yep. union, yep. Similar, 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 similar operating style. Yeah, well again, their philosophies are the same as ours. Is it's all member driven, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, co-ops are not new. They've been around for. I'm not going to venture thousands of years, but they've been Long around time. for hundreds of years, and uh, you know, in every part of the country. Uh, one of the places that used to get mistaken as being part of Calgary Co-op was Mountain Cycle Mountain Mountain Cycle Co-op. Uh, which wasn't us, but it ran the same as a co-op. It was investors that were all members that shared in the profits, and, you know, they ran their business the same way. But for us, you know, there's lots of growth opportunities. Maybe not so much in, you know, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, where we're very strong already. Yeah. uh, But Alberta, British Columbia, 
there's nothing but open communities and areas where we can grow. And, you know, some of that might be with some of the stronger retails, uh, working with some of the smaller retails to, you know, encourage them to, to look at mergers and amalgamations. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing I guess that, that comes up in a lot of meetings is that, you know, this co-op is different than this co-op. So if you're co-op number one, two, three, four mm -hmm. at Otter Co-op, that's not the same as one, two, three, four at Calgary Co-op. It's, if you use that number, somebody else is getting your patronage. Mm. Uh, you know, they've talked about a shared platform for memberships. Yeah. Uh, not so easy to do. I mean, it's certainly on the radar, but I don't think it's something that's going to be solved. Like to try and soon. do something across Canada even? Exactly. Yeah. But where you do find strengths is, is uh, for example, I mean, we have a number of retails in Alberta and Saskatchewan that have merged, whereas before they may have had four or five different membership uh, structures or, or platforms, mm -hmm. they now have one. Mm. So you can use any one of those facilities with one number and get your patronage. Mm. And, and again, that's how you grow and that's how things get stronger is yeah. that, you know, again, you look at a smaller retail, maybe not a great balance sheet. You look at a yeah. bigger retail, pretty decent balance sheet. Yeah. You merge and amalgamate. You've got now a balance sheet that's going to allow you to grow in those different areas. So. Because when those, because you've said about you said about the patronage is the money you get back. So if somebody's spending, if somebody's spending a hundred thousand in product, they're going to get more than obviously yep. if they're a small retailer. If they yep. start boosting up yep. the membership, then Absolutely. they're going to get a bigger, bigger kickback. Absolutely. And again, you know, I kind of joked about it, and and it, I don't know if I should say it or not, but you know, when you have two retails that are operating, you know, within twenty five kilometers of each other, one retail is you know a little bit stronger, yeah, uh, a little bit better packed patronage given back and the other retail is not maybe not so strong not giving back as much patronage what's to stop this co-op member from getting services and products from the other co-op well in that particular case why not consider merge yeah you now have one co-op stronger balance sheet and now all the members get better benefits, better benefits yeah. yeah all right Okay, well that's uh, that's good. I mean, I've learned a lot in this uh, yeah. in this interview. So awesome. that's uh, that's great. I think for did you have any final questions or was that? No, I don't think so. I think <laughs> I think you definitely covered a lot. Terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything comes up that anybody wants to know about, I I am happy to answer any questions you've got. Uh, great. If if I could, you know, kind of put my last plug in uh, for our brand is. Uh, you know, Otter Co-op, you're at home here. Sounds yeah. good. And appreciate you taking the time to come and join the podcast. That was, uh, yeah, great information. And I will, in wrapping up, thank you for everybody who yes. has watched. And I will let you tell everybody where they can find us. Yes, please subscribe on YouTube um, through Crownsman Partners. Join um, also the Facebook group, Crownsman Podcast. Um, follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Twitter, all at Crownsman P. All at Crownsman P. Yeah. That is great. Perfect. Well, that will be that, that will I be a wrap for today. We covered everything. Awesome. Right? That's perfect. Thanks very much. Great. All Thanks right. a lot.